Uh, thanks everybody for joining tonight. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Joran. Thanks, Joe. Thank you folks for having me. Um, I will now share my screen. Hello everyone. Uh, again, thanks for having me here. Um, first of all, is there a way to do full screen but I can still see some faces? Okay, so thank you again for inviting me. Um, I've heard a lot of great things about Boston Kai as a uh, venue for kind of just like nurturing the research and industrial communities in the greater Boston area. They're very much well known in the research community. So uh, I'm honored to be invited here. I'm a senior manager at Apple. I used to be a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. That's where I did my, uh, my degree. And what I'm gonna show you in this talk are sort of like a trajectory about the work I did during my, uh, during my PhD and the transition to working at Apple, being a manager at Apple, managing teams, and that basically mix between research and shipping things and how in the world of ACI, it's like exhilarating and also how uh, at a place like Apple, uh, lots of the ACI principles that we all study kind of like apply. Um, I will keep this more of like a research driven type uh, presentation. So there's gonna be a lot of like, uh, exploring novel ideas, novel during that time, and then kind of like following through that research thread on like, we started with this question, how did we progress and how did it expand to where we are today and how that affected some of the work that I did at Apple and the stuff that we've shipped at Apple. So that's gonna be kind of like the idea of this talk. And um, if you have questions, just let me know and uh, we, can, we can start. Okay. So that said, um, I want to give you a little bit of an insight into how I think about research prob problems and research ideas, especially in the human computer interaction uh, space. So let's start with this analogy. So when humans talk, when you and I converse, uh, we have these channel for explicit you know, communication. Um, basically you and I can use our, you know, words, we can gesture, we can point at each other uh, to express and communicate. In the human computer interaction world, there are analogs to this as well. You've got your uh, typing, the ability to use your mouse, the ability as a touch screen to voice explicitly, uh, to gesture all of these things as like a direct explicit input for human computer interaction. So let me take you on a very quick detour about some of the work that I did that kind of like increases this explicit input bandwidth between humans and computers, especially on like non-traditional computing platforms. So let's let's go through this like rapid fire. So I did this work like way, way back in 2014 where in a wearable platform, you don't want to use the touch screen directly because you, you may have a fat finger or your finger actually occludes the screen. So how do you interact without occluding the screen? This is uh, one technique where you actually use the face of the watch for input, you can pan, drag, you know, press, click, etc. And here we're showing that you can play a game of Doom without even having to touch the screen. Uh, so in the same realm, kind of like trying to repurpose things that already exist in your device, like the lid of your laptop, uh, trying to kind of like actually detect and estimate a laptop lid angle using only acoustics. So ultrasound signals, modeling it, and understanding that the reflections of the lid actually affect the acoustic uh, ultrasonic signal being received by the microphone. So without any kind of like crazy hardware, we can estimate you know, the lid of the uh, laptop angle, and then we could uh, power interactive applications on top of that. Uh, going back to wearables, uh, what if you kind of like project input into this uh, input and, inter and, and display into your skin instead of the watch? Again, uh, small screen problem, so expand it outside. So here we have like fixed laser icons that you can tap and click that allow you to basically repurpose your, your skin as an input surface. Uh, moving on, so instead of discrete buttons, how about we do tracking continuously on your skin? So here's a cool technique where we use a ring uh, that emits uh, electro, uh, some RF uh, frequencies that's very specific, uh, tuned, and then there's an electrode on your strap, sort of like GPS, but on your skin. Uh, tracking the phase differential across uh, ac across your screen. And here we can power a continuous input, like playing a game of a 
what is this angry birds uh next so still in the uh, realm of wearables uh using gestures so we have electric field that we uh, actively bubble up on the around the device and then the perturbations and, and disturbances of the electric field as you perform your gestures is something we use as input and then we can detect that and then map uh different interactions based on top of it and then lastly uh what if you have like lidar on a smart speaker underneath uh, what can it do? So in this case, it can actually do some crazy things like understand uh, what's around it, also repurpose the area around it for touch and interactions. You could see ideas here borrowed from all the other work, but on kind of like tables and walls and other surfaces. Uh, so that's the idea there. All right, uh, here's another one, one final thing uh, on the watch, but um, kind of like using your a different kind of sensor to kind of like use your arm as an arm 2.0 you can generate all these like crazy gestures and i'll, I'll detail uh, later on how we did this uh just so you have some some idea but i'll tease this up a little bit here but this is again another example of explicit input okay that was very fast two to three minute rapid fire on that particular thread of increasing explicit input bandwidth for human computer interaction so let's go back to human-human interaction. It turns out that there is another uh, dimension to this, which is implicit channels. So when humans and humans interact, there is the other implicit channel like body language and gaze and all these other things that allow that channel to be really rich, right? So what is the equivalent of that in human computer interaction? It turns out that that is actually kind of like a weak area for human computer interaction. Uh, computers don't quite know implicitly uh, some of these other signals. Like you almost have to force and tell the computer, hey, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, to power all these other input uh, in very specific ways. So the question I pose here is, how do we actually increase this implicit input bandwidth so that we can enrich human computer interaction? So in this entire talk, it's all about you know beefing up this channel. So it turns out that you know once you can do that, you can have like uh, like a a device that maybe knows what your hands are doing without you having to tell it what you're doing, right? A, a very kind of like implicit way of providing input. Um, or if you have like a smart speaker, it like it knows what's happening around it contextually. Um, so wherever you place it, it has an understanding of its context. So what I'm really talking about here when I say like increasing that implicit input channel is devices that know what's happening around them. Um, and in this case, I call that context driven implicit sensing. So you don't have to provide any input to the system at all and doing it automatically. Um, all right. My day to day life is FaceTime and uh, not Zoom. So very terrible at Zoom. Okay. Looking good. Looking this good. Looking good. All right. Um, the only problem I hear is I can't see anybody, but I'm just going to imagine your smiling faces every time I move to the next slide. Uh, okay. So we talked about this, right? This is kind of like the, the kind of like one instantiation of this idea that I mentioned about uh, increasing that input, uh, implicit input bandwidth. So we, we should ask ourselves, why is that important? And so here's a couple of reasons why I think it's important if we get to solve this problem. So if devices can know what's happening around them, they can be more assistive, helping you kind of like get things done, whether that's doing a recipe or you know making a cabinet. Um, uh, they can be more accommodating. They can help you. They can understand that you are busy, that you are uh, kind of like in non-interruptible. So they will try to like limit notifications or at least understand that, uh, hey, I want to let this user focus more and so i shouldn't interrupt uh because it looks like he's busy right that would be like a really good outcome if devices know that particular state of the user and then uh, dear, uh close and dear to the stuff that i've done recently is health and well-being so if devices know kind of like what types of exercise you're doing or what types of activities that you're doing they can probably nudge you to perform uh better health habits and help you form uh, better habits that that's that's good for you uh, overall uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, and how it relates to some of the work I've, I've done at Apple recently. So, you know, just a teaser here. Uh, 
hand washing project was directly as a result of the research that I did uh, prior to joining Apple. And in addition to that, uh, the a lot of the cycling features that were recently announced in WatchOS 8 was also a result of that. So I'll speak a little bit more about this towards the end of our uh, of this talk. So I've laid out at, at the moment um, what type of problem I'm addressing and why that's important. And so now let's talk about why is this a hard problem? So I'll bring up three things here. One is practicality. In order for you to make this happen, you a lot of people like instrument users with lots of different sensors or lots of different kind of like computing platforms. Uh, and that's fine. You can probably get around to lots of, you know, detecting lots of things with that, but it's not practical. You, people need to pay more. People need to wear crazy things. Uh, so it's a challenge. And related to this is the notion of fidelity and semantics. So even if you pick something that's practical, you're not going to get your high fidelity sensor data or high fidelity information to get you to the context that you want to detect. And so also, if you want high fidelity, that probably means not practical or you know, adding a lot more uh, burden to the computing platform or to the user. And finally, a third angle here is privacy. If you want high fidelity, you have uh, a good chance of uh, needing more than what's required. Therefore, uh, uh, kind of like this tension between fidelity and privacy. So all these three things are actually kind of like orthogonally related to each other and they play like a tug of war that makes this problem actually quite hard. So the sweet spot here is how do you find something that's practical that has enough fidelity uh, and is also privacy sensitive to allow you to kind of like solve or address the problems and the opportunities that I just mentioned earlier. So, you know, a book of my work, I'm just gonna show here like kind of like the papers that I've done uh, throughout my career so far, and this is a little outdated, but you've got this, but then I also focused, uh, you've got your breadth and you've get, then you've got your depth. So a lot of this talk that I'm gonna mention today is this middle purple section, uh, kind of like just going through deeply, how do we try to solve uh, this particular problem? And, you know, highlighting that was my dissertation. Okay, cool. So let's lay that, let's lay it out in this uh, kind of like, uh, map like a, a diagram. So fidelity on one side, practicality on the other side. There, and so there are a lot of solutions that people have explored so far. Low power sensors, they fall in, in one part of this graph. Distributed sensors fall on another side of this graph. Uh, infrastructure mediated sensing, it's more of like a research type approach. Uh, one sensor for many things. Um, and then wearables are sort of like in that like almost sweet spot. And our goal is to sort of like how do we move to this uh, other quadrant? How do we either get one of these pieces and move it to that other quadrant so that they're both practical and high fidelity? So that's this particular research area. And of course, there's the third dimension which is privacy. You want at least um, for most of these solutions are in this yellow area to also be privacy sensitive. And um, I'll, I'll have a little comment on that uh, later, but these are the three things that you want to tune uh, and that's what this research area is going to focus on. So in this talk, I will briefly mention uh, some exemplar projects, but I won't have time to talk about all of them. So I'll focus this talk on uh, the wearable scheme. So um, things that help you kind of like understand implicitly what your hands are doing. Um, so that's one dimension. Uh, the other ones are you instrument the environment. So you instrument the user or you instrument the environment. And so in this talk, uh, I'll talk about how you instrument the user so you get this implicit understanding of human computer interaction. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'll focus on, on this particular area. With that said, uh, let's dive deep into these projects. So we start with a source of human activity, which is you, the, the person. So if you understand what the person is doing, uh, you can peer a little deeper into your context. So I really like to bring up this quote every time I put in kind of like a watch wearable type uh, slide, because uh, you know the hand is indeed the visible part of the brain. So if we understand what your hands are doing, we can probably understand kind of like your habits, uh, your mental state, your 
propensity to uh, do other things. And so it's, it's really cool to kind of like think of the watch as this enabler, as, as an enabler to make, you know, uh, what you're thinking or whatever it is that you're doing a lot more, uh, you know, interactive or kind of like meld, blending these multiple worlds uh, together with just this one piece of uh, computing platform. So one thing that we're really good at with our hands is, you know, we do lots of other everyday things, but we also kind of like one thing that defines us as being humans is the tools that we use and the objects that we interact with. And so one dimension here for, for kind of like understanding context is actually what objects you're interacting with is a very good uh, entry point. So how do we do that today? Right now we sort of like use things like RFIDs, uh, barcode scanners and things like that to sort of understand the objects around you. Um, but there are limitations to this. Specifically, you know, you need a camera, you're not quite sure whether you're actually truly interacting with the device or just nearby, et cetera. So the holy grail for this approach is actually like understanding uh, the moment of interaction, now what that object or interaction you know, methods are uh, in a form factor that is practical. So that's the holy grail. So how do we actually get that to work? So I'm gonna talk about some approaches that I've done to, to, to solve this problem. So one particular method is this idea that your body actually absorbs electromagnetic noise uh, in a, you know, as you go to your day-to-day. -day. And so if you can create a sensor that can read or at least detect the electromagnetic noise that your body is absorbing, uh, then you can probably do some really cool things with it. And so that's what this project is all about. So we built this prototype where um, it's basically tied to your, uh, it, it requires an electrode that, that makes uh, contact to your skin. Uh, and then from there, we can then understand the, uh, you know, the EM noise that's being absorbed in your body through like a really fast uh, ADC. Uh, you can see it in this version one prototype. Uh, and here's kind of like V3 prototypes. Uh, but from that prototype, here's a video of what signal received looks like. So as you interact with these different objects, it turns out that they have very unique electromagnetic noise signatures, as you can see here. And so those electromagnetic noise signatures are actually something that a, something that a machine learning model can learn and therefore uh, can sort of like detect uh, without providing any input. It's just like literally uh, kind of like the moment of touch is when you can detect that, you know, something has happened and what that object is. And so I'll show you how that's done. So the process is basically, you saw the prototype earlier. So we have like a very fast ADC uh, that is tied to this device. And that fast ADC was what allows us to read electromagnetic no noise within kind of like the one to two megahertz range. And so from that, we perform a, uh, just some basic signal processing pipeline, specifically kind of like subtracting environmental noise to the incoming signal to get us what we call our uh, EM signature. So once you have this like noise subtracted EM signature, we then feed that into a kind of like a feature extractor and a machine learning classifier to enable object detection. Um, and so I want you to pay attention to this pipeline because uh, I reuse this pipeline multiple times in uh, a lot of my other projects. So this is the, the basic thing. You've got a signal, you process that signal, you extract it as best as possible. Uh, you feed it into a uh, feature extraction scheme, whether that's deep learning based or that's just like handcrafted. And then you feed it to a classifier. It gets you your uh, implicit input detection. So in this case, you know, I, I don't have to go through this slide, but what this means is like, it doesn't have to be your hands touching objects. It could be any kind of like contact point in your body. Cause you know, you're, you're like a gigantic sack of water. You're like a conductor. Uh, and so as long as you conduct electricity, any part of your body uh, that interacts with these objects can be detected by this device. So let me show you kind of like some example applications. Once you have something like this, like why is that important? Why is that relevant? So this is a little bit more futuristic, but I feel like there's some really good threads here that can be applied as we sort of like navigate this future of devices that can uh, understand context much more easily. 
So here, a you know, user wakes up in the morning, brushes their teeth. We detect that you know, it's an electronic toothbrush. We automatically push out a timer, helping the user complete their, their task. You here we assume messages and a meeting in 12 minutes. This is an electromagnetically actuated door. So it actually has EM signals. And so if we can detect that you've in entered your door, on my way home. you can sort of like have this experience relevant to that physical object. And so you leave messages and by the time you- Don't forget to pick up the milk. Kind of like get out at certain parts of the day, you get a reminder. And then we, of course we can detect your mode of- You are 10 minutes from home. It automatically pops up like a map with a shortcut tied to like your mode of transportation. In this case, you know, avoiding traffic. So these are just examples, but uh, the point here is that by not being very kind of like by, by reducing the friction between, uh, you know, input to the, to the device and the context of the user, you have this like really quite interesting uh, application spaces uh, just by this very simple sensor and signal processing pipeline that I've showed here. Okay. I'm gonna breathe here a little bit because we're gonna just continue diving deep on this particular area. Any questions so far? Otherwise, I will keep going. Cool. So that was EM Sense. That was taking the, the, the physical phenomena of your body absorbing electromagnetic noise and then sensing that part and then using that to feed implicit interaction uh, applications uh, from a vantage point of a wearable. So that was a cool project, but you know, not every object actually emits electromagnetic noise. So you still have like some gaps here, but it turns out that you can complement that type of approach with another physical property that uh, also is, you know, present almost ubiquitously, universally across you know all of the interactions you do with your hands. And so that's what this next project is all about. So everyone here familiar with uh, an accelerometer? Accelerometers are typically um, sampled at 100 Hertz. So most of your devices have this, your phone has it, your watch even has it. So 100 Hertz is actually pretty good for detecting basic things like, did you raise your wrist uh, or not, et cetera. So for a context of a watch, that's, that's useful enough. But it turns out that a lot of these accelerometers can also be tweaked into a rarely used mode. Actually, you can sample them at 4,000 Hertz. And this project kind of like pushes the boundary of what, uh, what you could do if you have some kind of sensing mechanism uh, such as this. And so once you can actually like sample at 4,000 Hertz, you can detect the micro vibrations that are propagating uh, from your hands uh, through the watch. And I can, uh, th I'll show you in the next, you know, several dozen slides or, you know, a couple dozen slides, how this simple technique like opens up a lot of doors for uh, interaction possibilities. So again, at this incredibly high speed sampling of 4,000 Hertz, we can detect like many, many things. So it, in terms of the theory of operation, I want you to uh, pitch in this video. The, the top graph is regular accelerometer at 100 Hertz. The middle one is 4,000 Hertz and the bottom is microphone. So note that when I'm interacting with this toothbrush, for example, you get your full sinusoid at the 4,000 Hertz sampling rate, but not at the 100 hertz sampling rate. You completely miss it. So what that tells you is that this, uh, this sampling, this specific technique is really great for uh, a lot of these things that a, a typical accelerometer is not tuned for. And you could also notice that the microphone is just going like crazy all the time, but then, um, but then the 4,000 hertz accelerometer only picks up the signal at the moment of touch. So I'll repeat that video because it's a very important idea. Um, so when you turn it on, you, you see it only when you're touching it, right? And, and the microphone theoretically can sense the signal, but it is airborne and it is susceptible to a bunch of different noise. And here, hand is away. So 4,000 Hertz is blank, but now when you touch it, you see the signal. So that property of on-touch detection is, is quite important to make your system more robust, uh, more practical, and uh, less susceptible to noise. So with that setup, let's now go to what you can do with this technology. So there's, I'm gonna show you one, one or two different kind of like big threads. Uh, so let's go through the first one. 
which is similar and building off, off of EMSense, uh, again, object detection. Turns out that most objects vibrate. Uh, so in addition to EM profiles being absorbed by your body, uh, we can also pick up vibrational profiles picked up by your hands. So in this case, uh, the 4,000 hertz accelerometer serves as our um, transducer for this vibrations that your hands are experiencing it. So same pipeline as what you saw earlier, you got your signal, you transform it into a way that maximizes the distinction between all other activities or objects that you're trying to interact with. You apply feature extraction, you feed it into a classifier, it gets to your object detection um, application. So from that, let me show you like the system running in real time. So here are different objects. They're not necessarily electronic, but they have specific vibrational profiles. And it turns out that each vibrational profile is unique to that particular object. So that allows us to detect all these kinds of appliances, all these kinds of tools that your hand is experiencing through these vibrations. And so let's let's keep that like a toy car vibrates, a panel saw and the different serrations and gaps. Those are distinctive. Uh, all these things, it's, it's quite amazing actually like how many unique things there are. Uh, and you don't think about this every day, but your hands are experiencing quite a lot of vibrations at any given moment. Okay, so once you have that, you can have applications on top of it. So here's a recipe example. You can have like an egg beater step and then it detects that you're using your egg beater and you've got a progress bar. When you stop, it knows that you've stopped and so the progress bar also stops. Here's uh, a guitar tuner. It turns out we can pick up the vibrations caused by the, uh, the strings of your guitar. And here's a, like a Nerf gun example. We can detect the, the cocking versus the shooting vibrational profile and we could use that to kind of like blend this physical world and the digital world together. So in this case, we know that you're probably low on ammo and it's time to run. All right, so it's a, it's a very interesting concept of like something that has no electronics and how do you bring that to the digital realm? Like you got your, your kind of like your wearable as a conduit to that. And with your sensing capabilities, you've now blended these two worlds together. Um, and then here's a graph of all the different objects that uh, uh, we can detect uh, as a result of this sensing mechanism. So pretty cool stuff. It then, again, it's complementary to the previous technique that I just showed you. So instead of electromagnetic noise, you complement that with vibrational profiles, uh, leading us to kind of like, uh, you know, closer and closer to the realm of practicality. Okay, so in addition to objects, uh, let's move on to other things that your hands are sort of experiencing and that we can enable with this technique. And I call this fine-grained hand activities. So first, let me try to define what I mean by fine-grained hand activities. So in this particular case, I define hand activities as a, a, a hand act, like a hand movement or hand action that is uh, uh, sustained over time and is continuous. Right, so typing is sustained, uh, you know, rolling a pin is sustained, washing a hand is sustained, writing is sustained. Uh, sustained is an important distinction here compared to like transient, like a gesture, like a gesture when you do something that's a lot more transient than like me typing, me washing hands. So that's a, a distinction that I make here when I talk about hand activities. So I wanted to actually understand what are the types of things that you're hands are actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Because right? ne we never think about it, but we now have a chance with the technologies that we have to sort of probe into this. So I did a study where I performed an experience sampling methodology. And then in this case, I you know, have devices given to you know, multiple participants, about 50, um, about 100 days cumulative, 950 worn hours. And this watch has an app running that I would sleep, wake up, uh, record some accelerometer data, uh, ask the users for a label and say, hey, what were your hands doing? And then go back to sleep. And then it would repeat this throughout the course of the day. And then users were, were uh, instructed to just, you know, provide uh, data to, to, this, to this app uh, through an experience sampling methodology technique. It's not perfect, but it gets you like a pretty good coverage. So from that, you know, here's a screenshot of what that, uh, prompt looks like. So the prompt pops up and it says, what were your hands doing? And users have options and says, I don't know, uh, dismiss this prompt or let me label it. And then you've got like, you go through a list of things 
or the user can manually add their own uh, activity. So from this, kind of like after filtering, after removing duplicates, et cetera, here's kind of like the list of what uh, we think uh, most, uh, what most people's hands are doing at a very given moment in time in this particular study. Lots of cool things here, but let's go through the top 10. Just let's zoom in on the top 10 and top 15. Um, no surprise there. The most common hand activity is like doing nothing. Uh, so, you know, that comprised sort of like a big chunk of, of, uh, of the data and uh, kind of sad result, but like most people are also like either scrolling on their trackpad or their phone or typing on a keyboard. Uh, hopefully that changes, <laughs> but that's, that's what it is. Um, and a bunch of other things here that are interesting. But uh, another surprising thing is uh, uh, smoking made it to the top 15. And also it looks, looks like uh, people smoke as frequently as they wash their hands. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, uh, these are interesting things to sort of like uh, help us understand, okay, what are these hand activities that people commonly perform? And are there ways where we can detect some of them, like create, pick a subset, detect some of them. And if we can prove that we can detect them, we can probably be on our way to at least understanding the types of hand activities that we can power uh, or create experiences around. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, so another kind of like overview of the data here is that, you know, lots of different edge cases. Uh, and in a lot of ways, you know, people are doing lots of things with their hands. So we wanted to pick a few of these uh, subsets and see if we can detect them uh, in a multi-class classifier, 30 classes, one classifier, and see how well we do and what can we power based on these um, uh, experiences. Okay, so notice uh, item X here, which is washing your hands. And I want you to remember that because that leads into um, uh, some of the aspects, uh, later parts of this talk. So, we did a follow-up study from this data. And so from, from this, we then performed an obstacle course uh, where we have an obstacle course of different activities. And then we, our users came in and we collected data as they performed through different uh, part, portions of the course. And then we used this data to then train uh, a model. And then we sort of tried to understand and validate whether we can detect them or not. Um, Here's the uh, deep neural network that we uh, proposed. And uh, the design of this is based on this architecture, uh, kind of like a variant of the VGG-ish architecture. But the interesting bit is uh, instead of like your traditional RGB in an image, we used our XYZ uh, accelerometer spectrogram at sampled at the four kilohertz sampling rate. So you almost like get a spectrogram image. Uh, you can't really do that if, if you only sample 100 hertz, but because we sample at 4,000 hertz, we get this rich nuance data as a result. Um, and here are the results. Uh, it turns out that from this uh, particular model with this subset of activities, mean accuracy per user trained was about 95.2%. And if we create a global model with some false positive, uh, false, yeah, false object detection mechanisms as well, we can uh, achieve 92% uh, accuracy and an unknown rejection rate by 86%. So this is a good start. And what this tells us is that we can indeed model some of these hand activities uh, with the sensor data that, that uh, we proposed in this uh, particular project. Um, and then a question that I get asked all the time is, what do you really need 4,000 Hertz and what is, how does the accuracy drop off, uh, drop off if you reduce your frequency? So it turns out that the higher frequency is always better. Um, there's a monotonous uh, 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 improvement uh, right at 500 hertz. And if you go below 500 hertz, uh, the accuracy drops, which makes sense. Like people's hands don't move as fast as 500 times per second. Um, but but what, that, what this tells us is if you uh, kind of like tune to 500 hertz, but then sample at a higher rate, that means you can have a higher fidelity signal uh, in a shorter amount of time. So you don't have to wait too long to fill your, uh, your FFT buffer. Uh, in this particular case. Okay, interesting result there. And if you also plot this in kind of like a TSNI type visualization, you can see some activities are sort of like related to each other and sort of like verifies that indeed, you know, we're learning something uh, here from, from the data. So uh, here's a video of the system in action. So, you know, the model here is running live uh, using the data streamed from the watch. Uh, the watch is on the right hand. 
uh, not the left. I mean, you, I'm wearing two watches here, but the watch that has the sensor is the right hand. Uh, we could detect all these things like clapping, scratching, um, petting a pet, chopping knives, washing utensils, uh, washing your hands, et cetera. Okay. So before I go into to the Apple work, I want to kind of like just summarize a little bit about what I've shown so far, which was, you know, my goal was to increase this implicit input bandwidth that was lacking in uh, sort of the most human computer interaction uh, work so far. Uh, there's multiple approaches. You can instrument the user, you can instrument the, the, the environment. In the projects that I've shown you, it's particularly about instrumenting uh, the user. And I've shown you like techniques that hit the goal of practicality, high fidelity, and uh, privacy preservation. Um, and so, you know, just taking a step back, I think I've, I've shown in, in, in that body of work that you know, picking the right signal and picking the right uh, models and picking the right approaches to sampling and pre-processing them gets you really far and gets you to this zone of practicality. The true test of practicality is actually, can you ship these experiences out to the world for millions of users to try and use? And that's uh, sort of one of my missions here uh, in my work at Apple. So that's what I'm gonna try to, to show you. Um, over the course of the last three years, or two and a half years that I've been at Apple, I'm very proud to uh, have had a hand in influencing the direction and also have helped ship uh, features as a result of my research. Um, uh, you know, the health hand washing project that was released uh, during the COVID pandemic, we conceptualized before COVID and released during COVID. Uh, some of the assistive touch work where you use hand gestures to kind of like help with accessibility and some of the fitness and uh, uh, cycling features that recently came out of watchOS. Um, so I will talk deeper on the hand washing project, but I just want to uh, sort of uh, describe a little bit and what the, the, these other two are. So let me start with the assistive touch. Basically, we leverage uh, the sensors on the watch to help users with, let's say, accessibility, accessibility impairments perform one-handed gestures on the watch. So with clever uh, signal processing and clever machine learning, we can detect things like single pinch, double pinch, single clench and double clench. And uh, some folks in my team has helped uh, productize uh, this feature. Uh, so we're very proud of that work. Uh, and, and you know, if you have an Apple Watch, you can try this today. Uh, and then also, uh, in addition, we also help ship uh, the recent cycling features, automatic cycling detection uh, features that are part of kind of like this super set of cycling related uh, uh, features from the Apple Watch. So we not only can we detect that you are automatic, like that you are engaged in a cycling workout, whether that's in an e-bike or in like a regular bike, but also we power things like automatically pausing, automatically resuming, and it feeds into the classifiers for fall detection. Uh, so if you fall on your bike, that system feeds into this notion of we know you're biking, we know you've taken a fall, and so therefore we have this notion that you've taken a fall while biking. And so we, or we push uh, calls to 911 and things like that in the hopes of, of helping people and uh, saving lives in some instances. So, you know, very proud of the work that's done, uh, that, that my team uh, has done in the space so far, but I wanna kind of like dive deeper into one of the uh, more relevant projects in this uh, kind of like time that we're experiencing right now. Um, oh, before I do that, I also want to mention that my team also publishes. So not only do we ship things, we're also very actively engaged in the research community. Uh, in fact, uh, two of our papers have been awarded, uh, you know, you know, you know, distinctions in, in, in the community, and we're proud of that. So not only are we showing that we ship things, we are also publishing. That we feel like uh, I feel like Apple is a very unique place for me to do both, and um, I'm having a blast so far. So that said. Let's dive, let's dive deep in the hand washing feature on the Apple Watch. So, you know, Apple wants to help you stay healthy, uh, whether that's through like helping you with, with, with sleep features or uh, new sensors for detecting blood oxygen or, you know, just fitness features in general. Um, so one question we ask ourselves is, can we help prevent sickness? You know, 100K people die from hospital acquired infections, 48 million get sick from foodborne illnesses, and majority of people get you know two to three colds over the course of a year. It turns out that you know just the mere fact of you washing your hands uh, eliminates uh, and helps uh, a lot in, in in these issues that I've mentioned uh, 
you know, in this, in this three things. And so with that, you know, taking some of the work from the research that I showed earlier, can we actually make that happen and, and ship that to, to the wider population? And so we did. Um, this is sort of like the WWDC announcement of the future. So here's an overview. Our coach here is using machine learning models to determine motion, which appears to be hand washing, and then use audio to confirm the sound of running water or squishing soap on your hands. During this, you'll get a little coaching to do a good job. You'll see a countdown along with haptics and sounds to make sure you wash as long as you're supposed to. If you pause early, there's a polite note to keep washing. And when you're done, you'll see, hear, and feel it. Okay. So um, the, the idea here is that once we can detect that you're in this, you know, uh, that you're potentially washing your hands, uh, the idea is we use the accelerometers first to detect that you are indeed kind of like engaged in this uh, sustained hand activity of kind of like rubbing your hands together. But of course, you know, people can rub their hands together and actually not wash your hands. So once we detect that first phase, we then bubble up uh, uh, our other sensors, specifically the microphone to understand uh, sounds of running water or squishy soap. Once we've kind of like tied together this motion, uh, this, this motion of hand activity and the acoustic profile of uh, sounds of water and squishy soap, we then bubble up a timer. Uh, and that timer is kind of like tied to our CDC uh, recommendation of 20 seconds. So the timer helps users kind of like go the extra mile of actually hitting that 20 second goal. And uh, it's a pretty cool uh, uh, example of implicit interaction because um, I've, we've seen Android apps where the user kind of like washes their hands, opens the app, runs the timer, does its thing, and then kind of like, you know, gets the timer there, but that there's a lot of friction there and it's not implicit, it's actually explicit. So here is like, it, it just magically appears and it knows what it is that you're doing and then it helps you achieve your goal. The other thing here that we do is we detect that you have arrived home and if you haven't washed your hands in like a window of time prior to after arriving home, we then give you a, a kind of like a, a notification say, hey, you know, you, you haven't washed your hands since you're at home. So you might, you know, might wanna do that. Okay, so Our I want to talk a little bit about how we made this happen. So the on-device ML and implementation. So the very first step here is to understand the anatomy of a hand wash. So what is the anatomy of a hand wash? Again, similar to the terminologies I mentioned earlier, it's a sustained hand activity over time. It's not transit, it's sustained. Um, it's a two-handed interaction. Um, and the nice thing about a two-handed interaction is that it doesn't matter where the watch uh, is, whether it's in your dominant hand or non-dominant hand, we can always detect it because it's a two-handed interaction. So that's a really important property. And then finally, there's the presence of water. So all these three things uh, together gets us to kind of like a very good approximation of a hand-watching uh, activity. And so from there, you know, you just examine the data. You've got your your, your, your accelerometer data that it can help you detect the uh, motions of scrubbing, your audio data that gets water running, uh, you know, rinsing and some non-hand wash activity to help you kind of like distinguish which segment you're in and kind of like how to appropriately increase that, uh, increment that timer or decrement uh, that timer in this case. So motion and audio together improves the detection as opposed to just one uh, signal alone. So this is a good example of uh, multimodal sensing to improve uh, practicality and robustness. And, you know, that, that's it. That's how, we, that's how we made it work. And, you know, to go from research all the way to shipping to millions of users is an incredible uh, feat of, of uh, uh, engineering that uh, I'm very proud of, and I'm very proud of the team uh, that helped ship this. And so it's just one of those examples where, you know, if you find the right place, you can take your research and scale it out to the world. And, and have like direct impact. And we're very proud of that. And so with that said, I kind of like want to take a step back and sort of like probe into how do you actually design sensing and machine learning systems uh, that has these, these sort of like, kind of like prototypes uh, of, of like a problem set where you feel like, oh, you know what, maybe you can solve this with like good sensing and good machine learning system. Uh, and you can make it practical uh, and, and ship it and have a more probability of, of, of robustness all throughout. So the idea here is you, if you have a way to split your domains into kind of like a low cost domain, uh, like a low power, low battery CPU, 
uh, versus like a high high uh, cost uh, CPU. And you you it it could it doesn't have to be CPU. It could be like whatever metric you use for uh, measuring the impact uh, or the constraints that you have. If you could split it and stage your your system to be in this particular way, uh, that will go uh, really far in terms of making a lot of these implicit sensing type techniques uh, work uh, out there in the wild. So there's a couple of things you have to ask yourself. Is your experience always on? Like, do you need to be able to detect uh, that particular thing uh, all the time? And so what that means is, do you need your sensors to run all the time? If the answer is yes, you have to really consider how do you make that system work if you have a sensor that runs all the time you have to pick cheap cheap in terms of power sensors that can get you approximations of that first step and then you then escalate and stage it to kind of like uh high power but less uh uh, uh but high precision type uh, activities and so by splitting it you have this notion of um, gain uh in in making it a lot more practical and a lot more engineering wise viable the next question is, is it low power? If it's low power, you're good. If it's not, you have to solve that part. And is it interactive? So if if the application needs to bubble up right away, you have a lot more constraint there because uh, you need to, need to make things happen immediately. Whereas some experiences can be done at a later time. So you can offload the sensing and the computation at a later time, let's say when the watch is charging or when the phone is in a state where it, it doesn't have to, um, do it later on you can do things offline so this, these are sort of like the questions that you want to ask yourself if you want to kind of like create these experiences that are implicit in nature but under the hood actually quite complex and uh quite sophisticated all right I, i've been babbling quite a bit here but hopefully this is sort of like a very very crisp uh, condensed way of, of expressing like a design pattern on how you make uh, some of these things work. Okay, uh, so with that said, uh, if you have an Apple Watch, try it. Um, I think it works on Series 4 onwards. Uh, it's not on by default, so you have to go to the setting and then turn it on. Um, and the public reaction to this feature has been great, um, especially when it came out and the timing of it was pretty good. And one of my proudest moments as a researcher is having my work uh, be kind of like uh, featured in the Daily Show uh, by Trevor Noah <laughs> with like a one minute segment. I was like, okay, I think, uh, I think my, uh, you know, I've achieved the highest uh, accolade ever for my career. No, just kidding. Uh, but that was a, a super fun time uh, where, where they were kind of like just, you know, expressing how excited and, uh, you know, they thought that Apple was continuously innovating. Um, and also the public reaction to the other features are also have been pretty good as well. So all of this together gives me some validation that you know the direction that I've put my research into has been great, that there is a path to solve this. And I'm like slowly creating a dent into the world in my particular way. And that uh, there's still more to come and there's still more work that needs to be done uh, to, to get this vision into uh, to reality for a bunch of other things that uh, that are out there. Okay, uh, I think I've done a minute to the 55 minute mark. So with that said, um, that's the end of my talk. I hope that was enough detail, enough uh, fidelity, and you've learned something uh, from that presentation. So with that said, I open the floor up for questions. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Welcome. so if, thank you. If anybody has questions, uh, yeah, just raise your hand. Uh, yeah, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, or do that, yeah. <laughs> um, am I audible? Yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. We are finding the unmute button is hard. Like you said, not being used to Zoom makes it hard to use the tool. But um, I'm very curious because this is this has some parallel with work that I'm currently involved in, in activity recognition. What I mean to say by that is you talked a lot about identifying a specific activity happening, asking the user for to label it, whether it was right or wrong, or, um, you know, label it differently if they had something else in mind. And um, I have two questions related to that activity recognition piece you mentioned. One is 
how do you recognize activities when they're performed serially as in let's say in um, a timestamp 0 to t you have um, you know 0 to k being activity 1 k to t being activity 2 how would you know that there were two activities happening and not just one at what fidelity do you stop and be like okay this was activity 1 the next piece is activity 2 and the second question is what is the minimum time that you need to ha- uh, you know observe an activity before you say it as an activity so is there a minimum time required okay. I got it. So you're basically talking about the segmentation problem. Yep. Um, the answer is you're not like this. It depends. Um, <laughs> so depending on what you're detecting, you need to be, you need to understand fully uh, what is the minimum kind of like duration that your system needs to be set up. So uh, let's say um, uh, gestures for gestures. Uh, they're pretty quick. They're, they're super transient, like, your time window there should be like quick, like one second or less. That should be like your, your window size. Um, for something like, you know, cycling or washing your hands, you can be a little, you, you can go above one second, right? Because if you make an assumption that hand wash is continuous, you could probably do one, two or three seconds as your, as your window. Um, and then for cycling, I mean, if the user is cycling, that could be longer, right? So you can use time to your advantage in this particular case. And then in terms of like, how do you know that activity A happened and then activity B followed and then something in between happened? How do you make that segmentation? So in any classifier that you do, you should always have, if you can, uh, a null state. So null state is you knowing all the other activities out there that is not in your class. And that's very important because if you don't have that, your class, you can't really trust your classifiers to tell you that, you know, this is A, this is B. And if they, have, they haven't seen something, they're going to say, oh, I think it's A or I think it's B. And they're not going to be super confident. But if you have this kind of like good data set of your negative set, that goes a long way. Thanks. Uh, Ryan, yep. Ryan has a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, great talk, really cool stuff. Uh, I'm curious how if you have any example of how you've dealt with either identifying or then dealing with bias with, with all the different um, actions you're trying to detect, obviously you have, there's a lot of cultural bias or environmental bias that you might have based on, let's say studying this just in California on a certain group of people. And you're not going to get a full picture of what it's like, for example, water might sound different in different faucets in different places in the world. So any, any examples of how you've dealt with that kind of bias? Right. So um, I think if you, if you set yourself up in the beginning where you sort of like bubble that up into your consciousness and say, Hey, uh, let's have a checklist or like a scorecard or, or whatever. When we try to look at our data set, make sure we have representation into the population that we're interested in. Um, that's one way you do it at the, at the beginning. The other way is a little more reactive where, um, not reactive, I'd say iterative, where you're, you start your model with a small pool of people because you want to you know, get the gr- ground up, up and running as fast as you want, as you can. And then you slowly increase your pool. Um, and that increases in, in pool. As you increase your pool, you then ask yourself, okay, when we increase our pool, uh, we should make it diverse and 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 can we make sure that we address this 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 uh this and then you increase your pool and then you see how well your model performs you take notes collect data improve the model and then increase your pool again and then just repeat the process so very like hci centric like iterative like design and and if you are careful in every kind of like expansion transition uh in terms of making sure your data set is diverse then i think you're in a good structural path there for data diversity and of course the literature also has different like strategies on how to make sure your data is not biased i I do have a second quick question which is just when you're talking about uh identifying a single action or something and then you want to uh know all the other possible actions and make sure you're not identifying you know something else that's similar um how do you deal with when you're gathering that data i noticed you had a really big chart of all these different hand motions there was one 
hand motion that might be more private that might not be included in said chart. Um, how do you deal with like that kind of thing where you're trying to obviously you want to know these things exist, these hand motions exist, but you don't want to falsely have people logging it in the wrong place or due to concerns for their own privacy, you might uh, kind of in, infect your data with some false uh, positives or negatives because of that. Is that something you dealt right. with at all with this research or? Yeah, so you can't like you can't possibly collect data for everything. Like there's just no way. Um, mm -hmm. So you try you, you try your best. Um, uh, there are ways where you can augment your data to help you sort of like synthesize like fake but relevant data to help increase your coverage. Um, there are sort of like data sets that exist, for example, uh, that are publicly available that you can try to kind of like compare so that you have like a higher superset. So there are, there are ways, but I think you can't detect everything. And so you just have to be uh, cognizant about that fact. Cool, thanks. Yep. Um, Raise hand, Aditya. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is basically a follow up from the first two. So the well, first question is like, there are a lot of activities the activities have like very variable length, like hand washing is like 20 seconds. Cutting vegetables can be anywhere from 10 seconds to God knows how long. And then even in hand hygiene, like you have hand washing and then you also have face touching, which can be really quick or it can be really prolonged, like sitting like this. So do you like train your models to, so does your like single model recognize all these different activities of variable length or do you use a different uh, strategy for that. That was my first question. My second question is basically similar, where like, do you do you also train your model on some of the confounding activities, especially for example, for hand washing, uh, you could be washing of fruit as well. And you may end up with like similar motion gestures with the accelerometer. So just how do you handle these two problems? Right, so let's tackle the first one, which is, um... Uh, I think if you want to have like lots of activities compounding on each other, uh, there's a real time decision that you have to make whether a single classifier can do the job or if you want to break it off into different classifiers in multiple stages. There's no, nothing stopping you from doing one to rule them all. There's also nothing stopping you from staging them. Uh, in fact, there's pros and cons. Um, so my experience so far, my personal philosophy is to pick the simplest possible solution and not try to try to solve everything. And you should prioritize. Like if you have like 25, why do you have 25? Like, do you need all 25, right? Just pick your top one, two, three, use the rest as your negative data set and then have that as your, as your model. Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the generic advice there. Um, and then in terms of um, um, like the false positives, uh, in any detection system, you're never gonna get perfect precision and perfect recall. You always, there's always gonna be a sacrifice between uh, being able to detect more and being able to tolerate false positives. And so you can think of it as a curve and your job is to pick a point in that curve and to fail gracefully if you have a false positive and to kind of like just do your best because you're never gonna be perfect because everything is, is probabilistic. Um, but if you know your domain really well, let's say hand washing, um, you have these tricks under your sleeve to help you use heuristics, for example, to kind of like get rid of the, this is a fruit versus this is something else. And that's when your expertise uh, comes into play. And it's a very different kind of like situation from like a, let's say a deep learning model where you just shove it, whatever you want, and then it will do something. Uh, Cause it will never do everything for you. Every particular application you wrap, you have your model, you wrap that with like, layers of, of other things to make it better. Like not, that one thing will never be able to drive an entire experience without any flaws. 
So your job is to understand your flaws, to understand where you fail and design around it and fail gracefully. That, that would be my, my advice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, two more hands raised. Uh, Massey? Hi. Hi, my name Hi. is Maciek. Um, I'm a Maciek. PhD student in health informatics and I do research on cognitive impairments. Um, I have a question about your role in this project. So when I think about what skill set is necessary to take this idea from conception to a product, it is very <laughs> impressive and also very intimidating. So I was curious because I'm thinking also about maybe going to industry, like what skill set is required for an individual person who is not a genius uh, like you, but maybe like someone for, like me. Um, what do I need to know versus what how let's say companies or labs can complement to what I have. So like, do you have software engineers, signal processing people on your team or do you do it yourself? Just curious about the whole process of the skill set. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so um, I'm just gonna use my own example mm -hmm. and then you can probably draw parallels from there. So in this particular kind of like space of like implicit uh, sensing and interaction. One of the primary skills is, you know, knowledge of sensors uh, is, is a very important one because that's your fundamentals. Like, um, and to me, the most successful teams I've seen are uh, if you have a domain expert coupled with like a, either a data scientist or like, or um, like a team of people who can complement that domain expert, uh, that's always a good, a good team. If you, if you can find one person that has both, then that's, that's even better, that's more efficient. Um, so you need domain expert, you need people who can do the modeling really well. Um, and then you need a, basically a person who can execute for you on the platforms that are relevant, right? Um, Cause you can think of it as like, there's the fundamentals from the scientist side, there is the kind of like the collection of data, the model, the training of, of those of those uh, models, and then implementing that into a platform. Those are very different things. And if you can run a team that has that composition, you can go really far. But you th even that team is only responsible for the driving of the detection and the classifier and all of that you still need like your designers and your whatever like on top of that right and so that would be the the combination of skills and then for you as a phd student i think you can place yourself in any one of those different things but maybe not much the platform person because that's probably not what you learn that's like pure software engineering you might be the kind of like either the domain expert for that particular domain or the modeling expert, or you can be both. So I can see you being there and then kind of like finding a team that has that and then partnering up with folks who can do the, the other platform implementation. Um, and then working with other teams. Yeah, working with other teams Thank you. Is, is paramount. Like you can't ship anything just by yourself or with a small team. Sure. And are you at liberty to say how many people are on your immediate team? Uh, yeah, that's public information. So um, I have about five to seven people right now in my immediate team. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Abhishek? Uh, hey. Um, first of all, awesome talk. Like, this was um, really amazing. Um, like a lot of the time that this technology and what it's basically enabled Apple to do. I was just kind of curious, like um, how do you guys deal with let's say actions that might have let's say different uh, intents behind them? Like just to give you two examples, for example, like um, you, know, you talked about how um, on the motorcycle, if you can detect that the person is, for example, on the motorcycle, you can tell them how long it's gonna take to get home. But for example, a lot of users might not wanna go home. They might, for example, wanna go to the store. Or alternatively, for example, let's say um, the hand washing case, like you can detect, for example, a person uh, is washing their hands under the sink, but essentially like uh, it might be, for example, because they have a cut and 
they're basically trying to um, stop the bleeding as opposed to because they're trying to clean their hands. So I wasn't sure if like if you have given any thoughts, so let's say actions that might be taken um, that can be detected, but which might not have the, I guess, common intent behind them. Right. So <clears throat> let me qualify by saying um, I'm not speaking on behalf of, of Apple when I answer your question here, because uh, you know, Apple has a very particular stand on what counts as a really great user experience. Um, and so in the videos that you show that you've seen, let's say the driving a motorcycle, that was me as a PhD student, kind of like showing what's possible, right? Yeah. Um, so th those are two different things. I wanna make a distinction that what Apple decides as a, as a as user experience is not up to one particular individual. It's like, you know, uh, there's an Apple taste. To, to all these things. Uh, so with that said, um, if I was to design a system to make sure to account into kind of like false intent, um, you should have a way as like a exit gate or like a, a way to exit out in case you predicted wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And if, you're, if your uh, experience has that, then you can basically take care of uh, most uh, false intent. So let's say in the case of a hand washing, uh, it's just, it could be as simple as having, adding a cancel button, right? So you do your thing, it pops up and it's not what you want, hit, just hit cancel. Um, and then that's it. That, that, that's, that takes care of that particular thing. Um, with the cycling example, it, it could be the same. Just add that, that, you know, I'm not cycling or I'm doing something else, like an escape hatch, and then you add other things on top of that. So that, that's how I would do it because you can never be perfect. Like you just have to keep that in mind. You're never going to be perfect. And that's okay. Uh, that's okay if you're not perfect in every detection mechanism. And you should design uh, with, with, with graceful failure in mind. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thank you. Yep. yep, thank you. Great question. Uh, Aditya. Yeah, I have a follow up from the response you gave. So when these okay. devices fail gracefully. Uh, do you use those moments to gather more data like cancel? So then does that go into your model as this was not hand washing and therefore the model improves in real so time? So you can, yeah, you can generalize that to what you can call a basically user input, right? Your model did something and then you can use user input to kind of like as a ground truth. Um, so in a good system, you should have these, um, you know, types of, of uh, user feedback mechanisms to help you understand, are you actually doing a good job in the field? So that would be a good example of that. Thank you. Yep. All right, I think we're 15 minutes over, um, but I'm, should I be reading the chats and other questions in the chat? Um, I. I saw there's like 45 messages in there that I haven't seen. If there's anything that Joe, you want to pick one or two, whatever, just feel free to bubble it up. Otherwise, I'm just going to scroll through this uh, before the end of this talk and then uh, read them if there's anything that I should be reading. Yeah, I think it was uh, most about Zoom. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think the people who asked uh, questions probably got their questions answered. Got it, got it. A lot of it is complaining about the rectangle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, I guess, you know, uh, if you have follow-up questions, feel free to shoot me an email. And um, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, this was such a wonderful talk. Thank you, folks.